del Departamento de, Antro uh, the de Antropología of de la Universidad of the University of Montreal. Eh, principal responsable. And main resp responsible eh, is pues de las uh, of the research that's been carried out there. Hoy día en, en Canadá, Currently in a, Canada a, about a precios, a las, the a las uh, de different wrecks de origen vasco. Uh, Basque Rex, no, I mean, nosotros, and he's well known amongst nosotros, us, sobre todo of course, especially uh, due to everything that has to do with the research of Nao San Juan. Where is all yours? So I will let the interpreters get used to my accent. Uh, they will certainly have a hard time following me because they're used to better English than we speak in Canada. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, this is indeed a great honor to be here with you. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, in person several people who've been really important for my link with the Basque country over the years. Uh, here in the front row, there's Manu Izaguirre, there's Eric Ritt. Further back, there's Mira Negaña. These are people that have, uh, over the years, have been a, an important link for me to the Basque Country. Back in Canada, there's Robert Grenier, who unfortunately is not here. Uh, these are people that uh, all of you know, and uh, you realize how important they've been for the connection between the Basque Country and Canada uh, by way of uh, underwater archaeology over the years. Uh, my own role in this has been that of a researcher and a university prof. If there was one person who was important for suggesting to me that I should become a prof, it was Manuisa Giri in Bermuda in 1991, who said, you know, you know this much, you should teach this stuff. So that's what I'm doing. Thanks, Manu. So I'll talk about, um, and I, I confess that I did not know exactly what my audience would be like here. I didn't know if you would be archaeology specialists, or if you would be students that would be interested in archaeology in general, or if you would be members of the general public. I didn't know. So what I prepared was something that will hopefully uh, not be too general, uh, but will show uh, what we know about Basque shipwrecks, how we know they are Basque, and why we know they are Basque. So in this talk, um, so in this talk, I would like to review what we know of Basque shipbuilding in the 16th century from an archaeological perspective. One ship in particular, the San Juan, which was lost in 1565 in Labrador, we call it the Red Bay ship, uh, has played a giant role in building our knowledge. But it's also important to put this example into a wider context. Uh, I prepared two maps. I don't know if you can see this very well. Uh, these maps show the locations of shipwrecks that have been assigned to Basque shipbuilders over the three centuries from about 1460 to about 1760. On the European side, we see six wrecks at Newport, Catwater, Studland Bay in southern England, and in Wales, uh, Guernica, which we call the uh, Urbieta wreck, Orio, and Cavaler sur Mer. The Newport and Cavalier ships have dendrochronology dates that, I, if I'm correct, date from 1460 and 1479, which makes them the oldest examples in the Basque shipwreck sequence. There are also the only ships that show lap streaks, the only ships. There are boats that show other lap streaks. The Newport ship is entirely clinker built, while the Cavalier ship has a carvel uh, planking below the waterline 
and clinker planks higher up, including the Stern Castle. Catwater and Studland Bay have been dated to the 1530s on the basis of associated ceramics. Guernica is a small boat from a river context attributed to the late 15th century, and Oreo is a coastal freighter with a cargo of iron ore in a 16th, that it's built in the 16th century style. On the other side of the Atlantic, we see 12 wrecks in Canada, with no less than eight at Red Bay, Labrador, and the near port, nearby port of Chateau Bay. The Labrador wrecks have been associated with the 16th century whaling industry. They include three small boats called chalupas, and a slightly larger small boat that has been nicknamed a pinata, it could also be called a charua in the local language, as well as four large ships, including the San Juan. The chalupas show a combination of carvel and clinker construction, with the top two strakes being clinkered. Here you have a picture of the Red Bay Chalupa, and um, it's now on exhibit in Red Bay in Labrador. You have to get there to see it. And I just wanted to draw attention to the mixed uh, planking construction with the carbol strakes on top. They're made of, the top strakes are made of pine, and the bottom strakes are clink, uh, the bottom strakes are carbol, the top ones are clinkered. The bottom strakes are of oak. And they can be up to, the widest uh, dimension is 37 to 38 centimeters in width. These planks were actually carved to give a round shape because planks that are so wide, 37, 38 centimeters, cannot be bent very easily. So they were actually carved to fit the shape of the, of the frames. So um, elsewhere in the, Saint, in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, we have an intriguing example at a place called Ilo Mor, the Island of the Dead, which was excavated or inventoried in the early 1980s and has provided Majolica, do you see it? Majolica from Muel in Aragon, French coins with a 1638 date, and amazingly, two astrolabes one made in Portugal and the other one made in France. The structural remains have not been excavated, but an initial study suggests that the framing pattern is in the 16th century style. I'll get back to this map here, if you don't mind. All right. Um, near Quebec City, two wrecks, uh, the, uh, one wreck, the Maréchal de Santerre, was built by a Basque constructor in Bayonne and wrecked in 1759. It shows a very different framing pattern. This ship has massive floor timbers to which doubled assembled side frames are loosely attached. attached. A similar framing pattern is seen in the last two ships, also from Bayonne and lost in the Battle of the Restigouche in 1760. These are a frigate named the Machot and a cargo ship called the Marquis de Malos. I'll talk more about these uh, later on. To summarize, here, I'm having trouble with communicating with the... To summarize, the Basque shipwreck sequence includes 18 wrecks and extends from about 1460 to 1760. It has technological waypoints leading from the Carvel style to the distinctive 16th century framing style and finally the doubled side frames of the 1760s. Now I'd like to talk about some of these diagnostic features of 16th century Basque shipwrecks. Mm -hmm. um, here I'd like to refer to the work of um, Thomas Orting, who was a researcher in Texas, and Felipe uh, Castro de Vieira, who is uh, from Portugal, as you can tell, who is also working in Texas now. Um, other people have worked on this idea as well, but these two researchers have produced uh, interesting thoughts on, on 
the typology of 16th century Iberian ships. Um, so if we can relate our, six, our, our database of how many ships we have, 16, 18, uh, to a larger database, which was used by Thomas Orting to define 16th century Iberian Atlantic shipwrecks. Um, in the 1980s, Tom Ortling noticed that 16th century shipwrecks found in Canada, the Caribbean, and England shared certain attributes that he saw so, uh, that he interpreted as signs of a, an Iberian Atlantic tradition. So those are his words, Iberian Atlantic. His most complete example was the San Juan from Red Bay, but his corpus also included wrecks from Padre Island in Texas, Highborn Key and Molasses Reef in the Caribbean, and Catwater and Studland Bay in England. In all, Tom listed six features that he considered to be diagnostic of Iberian Atlantic shipwrecks. So let's have a look at these features. Uh, the first feature uh, here, we see a group of frames in the middle of the ship that are pre-assembled. That is, the floor timber, the barenga, is attached to the two genoras uh, with a very characteristic mortise and tenon joint. Uh, we call it a dovetail mortise. All the remaining timbers in the hull are not assembled in any way. We call them floating frames. Do I have a picture of that? Well, here's a model. If you look at it closely, all the other frames are close to each other. They're well organized, but they are not attached to each other in any way whatsoever. That's what we call the floating frames. These frames are only held in place by the nails and tree nails to the outdoor, outer planking and the inner structures. Here we have another feature, uh, which we call the fastening pattern, the pattern of nails and iron nails and wooden tree nails. Uh, here on the uh, pointer, no. Yeah. Here on the right, I. Sh I Put a, 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 I illustrated the pattern with the two wooden nails here and the two iron nails here on each joint of a vertical timber and a horizontal plank, which you see here. So that's a fastening pattern that is very characteristic of 16th century Basque shipwrecks. Uh, it's interesting to notice that the iron nails are in a vertical line and the wooden nails are diagonally spaced at each joint. The iron nails are close to the edge of the planks and the wooden tree nails are towards the middle. What I can't illustrate here is the three-dimensional aspect of it and I'll try to tell you how this works. These iron nails go straight into the underlying piece whereas the tree nails are all at an angle so that when you go to the same vertical timber and you see it from the other side, the tree nails actually exit on the other side in the middle of the timber. So they're here on the outside, they're on the edges, and on the inside they are all in the middle. So they go like this. Another feature which Tom Ortling identified was this stern was this large timber which links the keel and the stern post. Uh, we don't have a name for it in English. We call it a heel timber, a heel as in the heel of a, of a, of a, of a shoe. Uh, but we have the term from the 16th century texts and we know it's called a zapata. This is something we don't find in other shipbuilding traditions, so it's something that's unique to the Iberian Atlantic tradition. On the other side, so here you, sorry. So here you see that timber in place between the keel and the stern post. Another aspect that Tom Ortley noticed in the same area is that these large timbers here, which you see grouped here, have a little tenon on one side, and that fits into a, into a mortise here. 
These are small features that were noticed at Red Bay. Uh, you can tell that they have various values, uh, but they were attributes that are associated with the uh, Basque shipbuilding. Here, a uh, rather difficult uh, illustration that I made here, is the timber called the Kielsen, the Karlinga. Uh, in the Basque tradition, this Kielsen is a very large piece. It can be up to 12 meters long, even more. Uh, the bottom side is notched to fit over the floor timbers. And the central part is really large, and that central part has an excavated mast step inside it. On either side of the mast step, you see these lateral buttresses that go up against the first timber on the side. That as well is a characteristic of Iberian Atlantic ships, according to Tom Ortling. So that group of, that group of uh, attributes uh, was identified by Tom Ortling in a subsequent uh, work, he enlarged his database to include, and to include all known 16th century wrecks in the Atlantic, including examples from Portugal and England. However, his idea of an Iberian Atlantic tradition became the focus of a 1998 symposium in Lisbon that presented the recent discovery of three Portuguese wrecks from the 16th and early 17th centuries. One of these wrecks, the Nossa Senhora dos Potires, also known as the Pepper Wreck, was built in Lisbon and has been extensively studied by Felipe Castro. What I find interesting in Felipe's work is that it recognizes two distinct styles within the Iberian Atlantic tradition. The first style is best represented by the San Juan from Red Bay and includes Tom Ortling's original corpus with a few additions. The second style is best represented by the Pepper Wreck and, in and includes the Portuguese examples. So this chart, I just made it quickly to show some of the differences between the two styles. Um, so here we see the red bay style and the pepper rex style. And the, the wood species in the red bay style is only European oak, whereas in the pepper rex style we see different species. We see the roble and cimal, uh, the, the cork oak. Uh, we have the maritime pine as well. So these are different species that go into the fabrication of these other ships. Uh, the, uh, one, of, one of the interesting things, and I'll go more into it, is that the dimensions of the timbers in the Basque ships is extremely regular. That is the red bay style. In the pepper rex style, these dimensions tend to be more irregular and variable. So you see it archaeologically, if you go on to one of these wrecks, you immediately recognize the extreme regularity of the red bay style and the greater irregularity of the pepper wreck style. Uh, and when you get into the actual form of this mortise and tenon joint that's in the assembled frames in the center of the ship, you see that the morphology of the red bay style, that group of ships, is extremely regular. And in the pepper rack style, it is more irregular, with, even with double joints. Um, and some of them go higher up with the joints between the first and second futtocks and so on. So that's a more variable style. So these are, so when you look at the Iberian Atlantic tradition, there are, uh, there are actually two groups that we now recognize. And one of them is probably built in the Portuguese style. And the other one, which you can probably say is the Basque style. So if I can sum up this uh, new data from Tom Ortling and Felipe Castro, um, I think we can safely expand the corpus of Basque-built shipwrecks to include another five wrecks for a total of 23 examples between 1460 and 1760. This is quite a significant number. It reveals not only the productivity of vast shipbuildings on a European scale, but also shows the industry's distinctive technologies and traditions. So how do we explain 
these archaeological features that we see. Let's take a closer look at some of these features of Basque shipwrecks and try to understand them from the standpoint of a regional shipbuilding industry. Uh, let's start with the building materials. We recall that Basque ships were made of European oak, while Portuguese ships include timber from cork oaks, the Alcoronoque, and holm oaks, which we call the Encima. The exclusive use of European oak is in fact typical of shipbuilding all along the Atlantic coast, north of the Picos de Europa. Here we see the geographical range of the European cork, of European and, and uh, Encima, the two kinds of oak. And I think that we can safely ascribe the tree species found in Basque and Portuguese ships to climatic differences within Iberia. Digging deeper into the data, we can, we can reconstruct the three types, we can, we can re reconstruct the tree types and the forest landscapes that produce timber for Basque ships. Here um, I have a, an illustration that shows all the planks from the starboard side of the <coughs> San Juan. If we look at these hull planks, they're all between 33 and 36 centimeters wide. They're from four to seven centimeters thick, depending on where they are located in the hull. The longest planks fall between 10 and 11 meters in length, while the shorter ones form two groups of three to four meters and six to seven meters in about equal proportions. So here, um, I showed the, the long planks are in this reddish color. They're about 10 meters long. And then there are the six to seven meter long planks in blue and the three to four meter ones in, in green. Uh, my interpretation is that the original planks were all about 10 to 11 meters long, and these shorter ones were cut one third, two thirds in length to build a, a planking pattern that would be strong and where the joints would overlap. Um, in the shipwrecks that I've looked at, these long planks have no branches and have very few knot holes. These data show that the trees used to make the planks had straight trunks with a diameter of about 40, 40 centimeters and no branches to a height of 10 or 11 meters. In planks where I have counted the growth rings, the tree ages fall between 60 and 140 years and they cluster especially between 80 and 85 years. So we have our first view of the kind of forest that produced these typical Basque ships. As for the frame timbers, we can learn that they came from two types of trees. The first type provided the rising floor timbers at the front and the back of the ship. These are V-shaped timbers or Y-shaped timbers. Um, they, these irregularly shaped pieces came from the trunk and the branch of a tree that ranged from 40 centimeters, uh, from 40 to 200 years old. So there's a great variety in tree ages. All the other frame timbers, in other words, about 80% of all the timbers in the hull have an almost cookie cutter like regularity. Their typical dimensions are 19 centimeters on each side. On smaller ships and in the upper works of larger ships, it's square. This regular dimension, like the planks, is based on the Coro de Ribera, which is a distinctive Basque unit of length and volume that was applied to shipbuilding and the forestry trades. So this is a regional metrology that you do not find anywhere else in Europe. And when you find this metrological pattern, you know that these are Basque shipbuilders. In addition to their standard width and thickness, the frame timbers are all between 3.5 and 4 meters in length. These timber dimensions are similar for all trees, uh, for, sorry, for all ships from 150 to 450 toneladas. This is because the deck heights are always the same height, so you make the joints of the frame timbers at the same height as well. 
Why are the deck heights the same? It's because the cargo units are the same everywhere. These are the famous barricas. So we know that the trees that provided the frames had just the right length and diameter so that there's no, there was no waste of material. In addition, the, the shape of the trees closely matched the curvature of the finished frame timbers so that the wood grain follows the curved shape of the timber. There are no branches stemming from the timber along the entire length. So these are very ideal trees. Moreover, most were cut at a similar age. In the San Juan, Peter Waddell counted 45 to 50 growth rings. Sorry, 45, uh, 35 to 40. 35 to 40 growth rings in the frames that he evaluated for dendrochronology purposes. So these trees were only 35 to 40 years old. At cavalier sur mer I did a systematic count. And I counted the growth rings of all the timbers and found that 80%, see them here? 80% um, came from trees that were 65 plus or minus five years old. Since I counted the tree rings visually, my figures have a margin of error, and it's possible that many of the trees actually had precisely the same age. I don't think that such ideal trees with such a uniform age could be found in a natural forest. I think these frame timbers came from a closely managed oak plantations. Here, uh, there's a more detailed analysis with the floor timbers showing these ages here. The first farat, this part of the ship, showing these ages. And the third farak, the second farak, at this level, these are all identically shaped. They have very close, a, very, a very close age range. So this kind of study gives you an idea of what kind of forest produce these, these timbers. So based on these data, we can reconstruct three kinds of forests that produced timber for shipbuilding. The planks came from tall, straight trees that had branches that had no branches to a height of 10 or 11 meters. These trees were typically about 80 to 85 years old. Secondly, the angular floor timbers came from mature oaks of variable shape and size, and they seem to have been harvested in an opportunistic manner. Finally, most of the frame timbers came from trees that had just the right diameter, curvature, and branch-free length to provide the required pieces. In the Cavalier ship, the trees were around 65 years old, and in the San Juan, almost a century later, the same dimensions were produced in as little as 35 to 40 years. So these trees, today we call them trasmotos, and they came from carefully managed timber plantations. I found these trans trasmotos particularly interesting. Historical data from other regions of Europe shows how trees were trained to produce uh, curved ship's timbers. All the branches would be cut off, about two meters above the ground, about two, uh, two meters off the ground. The new branches that sprouted were forced to grow laterally using braces like this, or sometimes with ropes to pull them over. Um, and higher up, the branches would, would return to their vertical growth, quite naturally, resulting in an overall curve. All the branches were subsequently cut at the same time, the same year, for the same ship, and then the growth cycle would recommence. Such forestry practices explain the timbers we find archaeologically, and we can still see the remains of such practices in Basque cities and forests, although what we see today is probably the remains of the, of the charcoal industry. It's interesting as well that shipwrecks adapted their hull design to tree shapes and dimensions that were determined two generations earlier. So there's a very slow evolution of thought in, in, in architectural terms. When we analyze the system of hull design in Basque shipwrecks, we find a geometrical pattern of, of circular uh, arcs uh, that are arranged in a tangential relationship with other arcs of different radii. I'll just show how this works. So here, in this part of the ship, 
this part of the hull, you get a, a circular arc of one radius which produced that little part of the frame. Here, an arc of a different radius produced that part of the frame. And between the two, you have this long length here, which was an even larger radius. It's probably larger than that. My drawing isn't great. And that's how the master frame was produced. Subsequently, to produce the other frames, these arcs would be manipulated, their cords would be adjusted to produce all the other frames forward and aft of the master frame. This design system is very old. We find it in medieval ships, we find it in ancient Greek ships, and it allowed timber growers and ship designers to anticipate each other's needs. Such coordination between different trades and between different generations of people brought great efficiency to the Basque shipbuilding industry. And it also created a tradition that changed little over the course of the 16th century. So here you have some of these manuscripts that show how <coughs> ships were designed in the 16th and early 17th century. <coughs> now let's get back to this issue of the <coughs> Iron nails and the wooden nails. This, uh, this is a rather interesting feature. And historical sources tell us that Basque forests, let's just have a look at this. Uh, here we have a map of uh, the Basque coast. If you can't situate yourself, this is the Atlantic. This is mostly Guipuzcoa here. France begins here, this guy here. And, uh, that area, that narrow area, was reserved for shipbuilding timber, two leagues from the sea. Farther inland, the trees were used to make charcoal, required for a robust Basque iron industry. Wood for charcoal was produced and harvested, also using the trasmocho techniques. Archaeology also shows that the... So here we have... Uh, this map shows that different regions the coastal region was used to make timber for ships. and in the inland region, the forests were not used to make timbers, but were used to make fuel for the iron industry. Those are different techniques, often different tree species. Inland, we find more <coughs> beech trees, Fagus silvatica. And on the coast, we find the, the oaks. So this is a, a geographical separation of two industries. And these two industries collaborated to make the Basque shipbuilding industry itself more efficient. So what happens uh, in, this, uh, in these Basque shipbuilding trades, um, and we found this from the San Juan, Basque carpenters would first rapidly nail the planks onto the frames using iron nails, which were abundantly available. But iron nails are not durable fasteners in, a, in an ocean context. So, subsequently, a second group of tradesmen arrived in the shipyard to consolidate the hull with wooden tree nails. And these were the permanent fasteners. Such a division of labor was enabled by an abundance of iron and brought greater efficiency to Basque shipbuilding. Now this framing pattern, and I'm getting to the end of it, um, this is the last feature I'd like to discuss. Um, and this, this is the way in which the frame timbers are organized and assembled. In the middle of the ship, including the master frame, we find a group of frames in which the floor timbers and the first products are assembled. This joint is solidified with two large tree nails, which we see here the tree nails here, and two iron nails. The number of pre-assembled frames varies in a ship from 5 to 14, and there are usually more aft of the master frame than in front of it. All of the other frame timbers, including the upper products of the central frames, are not fastened to each other in any way at all. So here we see them. 
they're, even though they're not assembled together, their organization is very orderly, with an overlap of about one meter here. These timbers, because they have highly repetitive shapes, to the point where all the second products can be totally interchanged along the length of the ship, uh, allow an extremely great efficiency of producing these timbers already in the forest with a single template, and the same timber could be placed anywhere in the ship once the timber arrived in the shipyard. So this brought great efficiency to the Basque shipbuilding industry. Now, in conclusion, uh, we've looked at uh, what we know about 16th century ships. Um, I'd like to connect to the project that we have here. What about the Victoria? The closest shipwrecks to the Victoria are the Cavalier Wreck from about 1479 and the Studland Bay Wreck from about 1530. Both these ships had a carvel hull, while the Cavalier ship also had clinker planking above the waterline. Despite its mixed planking style, the Cavalier ship was designed using the same geometrical methods found in Carville hulls of the 16th century. The Cavalier ship is distinctive for its deeper, narrower floor uh, compared with the broader shape of the 16th century ships. Studland Bay, on the other hand, has all the attributes of the classic 16th century style of ships. So the Victoria, built a couple of decades before Studland Bay, may have been an early expression of the 16th century Basque shipbuilding tradition. I need to finish here. I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, I'd also like to thank all the people and institutions that have allowed me to study Basque shipwrecks over the years. I have been incredibly fortunate to receive their openness and generosity, and I'd like to pass the same spirit on to the next generation of researchers, which is seated here. Thanks. Thank you very much.